So here's what I've been thinking over the last few days. When you're trying to start a business, um, what really drives you? Is it the money? Is it passion? What comes first? Because lately I've been seeing a lot of businesses um, collapse or having different challenges. And I've always been asking myself, is what was the motivation? Because, because that's what is quite important, especially during the tough times like COVID times, what sustains you uh, in terms of um, driving the business forward. And over that I thought, maybe I just need to bring one of my good friends who's been running um, uh, a business and really it's, I mean, it's out of our passion that I've seen uh, doing this, something she's been doing for a very long time and um, working with um, really the communities across Kenya and she's, she's, she's doing something spectacular in terms of um, uh, enabling communities um, and actually sourcing products from communities. She handles um, honey and, and I thought this is one of the best probably one of the best topics that we, uh, we could have a discussion about in this business, how she started. Sylvia runs uh, Marigat Gold. Marigat Gold is one of the biggest companies that supplies honey uh, in Kenya and also does a bit of export uh, to the US. Um, and I really just wanted to, one, cover uh, how she started, how she's been doing. And towards the end of the channel, I'll talk about two things. One is her biggest mistakes so far. So you have to stay tuned to hear about that. It's very important if you're starting any business. Second point is Expo 2020, which is happening in Dubai uh, in the next coming weeks. So Sylvia is going for that event and she'll tell us more about it. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's been Thank quite you. a while since we talked. I thought you were the best guest actually to take us through. First, how did you start Marigat Gold? And what a name, by the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Marigat Gold, um, so I started it in 2015. Yeah. Um, so I'm from Baringo, originally from Kericho, got married in Baringo. And, um, you know, just when I got there, I saw there was such an abundance of natural honey. Um, but then, you know, if you drive through Baringo on your way to Eldoret, um, from Nakuru even, you will see a lot of people selling honey on the side of the roads, but a lot of the time um, it's really not in very attractive packaging. A lot of them don't have KEB certification. So I did see a gap in the market that there was very high quality honey, but the value addition was lacking. Yeah. Um, so that's when I decided to set up Marigat Gold. Um, there was a demand in the market for high quality honey, as you know, yourself, myself, a lot of people take honey for its um, nutritional value. And the problem is that in the market there's a lot of adulterated honey and therefore you're, you know, not getting the nutritional value. Um, if you're switching from sugar to honey for the nutri nutritional value, you lack that if the honey is not um, natural, pure honey. Um, yeah, so the motivation behind it really was on a more selfish um, level was to set up a business that would outla outlive me, um, really like a legacy project that um, I, I've been an entrepreneur for a while and, and I have always wanted to go into um, food manufacturing and value addition in the agriculture space. Um, so on a selfish level, it was really to build a really amazing company that would outlive me that, you know, my my daughter will inherit her, her children will inherit hopefully one day yeah. um, and then and then on a more macro level it was there was a need in the market all these smallholder farmers in Baringo who have very high quality honey but then they do, they lack access to markets um, so I would say yes it initially started with um, the hopes of making money like all of us um, and hopefully one day move away from full-time employment. Um, but then at the, while, while, while building the company, I realized that um, the vision or mission was much bigger than me, much bigger than <clears throat> making money. Um, and now it's about 
building communities, working with smallholder farmers, sourcing honey from them, providing uh, above uh, above market rate, um, <clears throat> and and you know providing providing a consistent market for their produce and of course there's ripple effects to that. Um, a lot of the smallholder farmers that we deal with are mostly <clears throat> women-led businesses and youth-led businesses and you know when you empower women a lot of the time women are very selfless. They, 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 when, when they're getting a consistent income a lot of the times it will, it will, it will show, you'll be able to see they build their households they provide um, school fees for their children. They have um, really meeting their basic needs. So yeah. 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 So it's quite quite interesting. So we started in 2015. Yes. That's number one. Um, just talk about really the process of getting the business up and running because uh, a lot of people in Africa. Uh, by the way, are, let me use the word, are hustlers. They are doing so many things yeah. on the side, doing <coughs> businesses and all this kind of thing. So what is critical? Um, was it, did you start from a small scale then sort of expanded? How did you uh, sort of plan your capital, plan your business so in terms of so that you can be able to get it up to where it is right now? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so one minute, let me clear my voice. Yeah, so, um, just like any business, um, when I started the business, I was actually very young. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself into, if I'll, be, if I'll be completely honest. You know, when you speak to a lot of people, they're like, yeah, I started with, I started and in a month I was making you know, Correct. the turnover was, I don't know, 300 percent. Everything, everything was in your head, calculated <laughs> yeah, that yes. <laughs> this is how my business in six months, I'll exactly, be doing this and exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, 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 had, I had the privilege of working previously with uh, another honey company um, that you may know of. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, through that, uh, because I have a marketing background, I did a bit of research. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, yeah, there's a gap in the market. And, and you know, when I started the business, I was extremely lucky. I think, I think, I think setting up successful businesses, yes, it's a lot of hard work, but I feel like a lot of it is chance and luck as well. Yeah. So I happened to be in the right place. I was um, a mentor at uh, Blaze by Safaricom. Uh, be your own boss uh, program that Correct. that ran for about five years and I did three years um, three seasons of uh, so that was like a business mentorship for any young upcoming entrepreneur so yes. you're a mentor okay. yes so I was okay. a mentor um, yeah. the target market really for the blaze program was young mostly college yeah. college students mm. who are interested in moving away from conventional um, career paths Correct. Um, so, so I, I was paired with um, a gentleman called Eric Mudomi, who is the founder of Stawi Foods. Correct. And uh, we both attended the Mandela Washington Fellowship. Um, so, an idea of how to run the business, but then um, it was, it was, it was a lot of luck that I crossed Eric Mudomi's path because he had been incubated at Kirdi, um, Kenya Industrial Research and Development Institute. Yeah. Um, so he told me, he was like, yes, I know you have the drive, I know you have the passion, I know you have the hunger for success and, and money, of course. Yeah. Um, and he mentioned, he was like, why don't you visit Kirdi? Um, they provide business training, they provide um, an incubator, basically. Yeah. Um, if you have a business, it will go from prototype to ready-to-market pro product. Um, so yeah, so I visited uh, Kirdi in South Sea. Yeah. And I did a six-month program. Um, so the thing that um, when when I just uh, started Marigat Gold, um, I I didn't have enough capital. <clears throat> so when I started Marigat Gold, I had I had a passion. I had a hunger for building a successful um, organization company. 
However, I didn't have enough capital. Um, so I approached my two sisters and I asked them to be my angel investors. Um, because at the time, you know, there's a lot of challenges, especially for women um, with access to finance. Um, traditionally, and you know, the social norms in Kenya is that um, the boy will at, sometimes at a very young age inherit land and it's that he true. can use it as collateral to, to get financing from the bank, to get debt financing. Yeah. So I didn't have that privilege. So I put my savings together and then approached my two sisters, Lena and Joyce, and I presented this idea and, um, and I did a business plan and then, and then, you know, I think they both saw that it was a viable business and we put our savings together and we set up uh, Marigat Gold. Um, but then but then that chance meeting of Eric Mudon, me, the founder of Starry Foods, and him directing me to Kirdi yeah. was a game changer, I would say, because I got support there. Um, we got, we got a food scientist as well who helped us um, wow. Wow. with the, uh, just you know, learning the entire process, uh, the, the processing part of, of, of any food production. And um, through there, they then um, suggested that uh, we all attend um, the National Beekeeping Institute School of, of Beekeeping yeah. and we got a certificate for that. Mm -hmm. So so that really set us apart from other 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 honey producers because you know we we got both the pickle and 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 the professional part actually. the professional part of, yeah, of setting yeah. up the honey business. So it's good. Quite interesting, and, and you've mentioned something that is, for me, very important. One is aspect of raising finance, which sometimes is very difficult for many businesses, that, uh, especially starting businesses. I mean, you walk into a bank and the bank will give you a hundred <laughs> lists of things to finish. Mm -hmm. um, you. You, you, uh, you try to raise financing from friends, it's not easy. So in some ways, you have to always take a chance. You don't know where your opportunity will come. Mm -hmm. For Sylvia's opportunity, it came through um, raising finance through friends, which is very important. And that actually takes me to a very important point since we are running your business right now. Let's be honest that businesses have challenges. They don't have, I mean, there's a rosy side, and there's a Tony side, as I always say. Mm -hmm. For Marigat Gold, Sylvia, just give us, in simple terms, just the three things people can challenge that you face. That someone will not repeat those mistakes that you've that you've done so far. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there've been many. <laughs> <laughs> there have been many over the years and, yeah. and I think I learn as I go and um, yeah I feel like if I did this interview four years ago I would they'd be fresh in my memory yes yes I think I've become hardened <laughs> like you even you're an entrepreneur so you understand I've, I've really become hardened yeah um, so um, I think I think number one would be Okay, it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Correct. So, so I would say find the market before, before you even find your supply. Right. Um, because a lot of people make the mistake, especially in agribusiness, they'll plant their dania, they'll plant their capsicums, and then closer to the harvest, that's when they try and find market for it. So I would say find market for it. However, for us, it kind of, um, it worked against us uh, because we, when we started, we had, we had enough supply. We were not, we hadn't set up our own beehives. Correct. We were sourcing from smallholder farmers. So we had enough supply, maybe I would say for about six months. And that helped us to establish, um, you know, really a supply chain and um, we we signed on enough retail customers and wholesale as well because our business we do retail and, and uh, 
uh, business to co consumer and and yes. business to business. business. So so yeah. so for the for the retail, we we stock in um, mini marts. I would call them that. Um, so you know the butchery at um, Valley Arcade. Um, ABC Place, Gilani Butchery, um, yeah, so Alpha Jury Supermarket. So they're, they're, they're a bit, and then, and then for B2B, we do hotels and restaurants. So for those six months, we really worked hard at solidifying our supply chain mm -hmm. and, 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 and getting, you know, mm -hmm. a, a solid customer base. Um, but then um, that was the year the drought hit. Correct. So we had stock and then we ran out of stock wow. so that's why i'm saying it's a bit of a chicken and egg my we lesson is get the get the buyer but then now we had disgruntled buyers because we've been supplying consistently for about six months and now we are sourcing honey and we cannot find it anywhere so and uh, uh, what you're saying is very true that point is that uh, every business and that is a fact mm -hmm. will face the chicken and egg conundrum yeah uh, you're always caught in between uh, where to go first is it the chicken that came first or the egg mm -hmm. that came first um, second one second point I would say I'll say cash flow yes <laughs> cash so is king <laughs> They always say that. Yeah, because when, when we started, the business model was, um, you know, we, we buy from smallholder farmers, we sell, and then we use the profits to buy the next round. That's, that's how it was. Um, but then, but then the, more, the bigger you grow, then, you know, even the payment terms change. Because when you're dealing with, with, with small consumers or mostly retail, um, you know, if... Actually, we tried to get into big supermarkets like Chandran and Carrefour, but then we just didn't have enough money. Cash flow. <laughs> yeah, right. cash flow, because the payment terms, some were about 90 days. So it's like, okay, fine, send the consignment and then you'll be paid after 90 days. The reality is it's never 90 days. Yes. It's, it's, so, so I would say cash is king. I am yet to figure that part out. Yes. Because like many businesses. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't have a trust fund, yes. so I could be preaching cash is king, but then the reality of many small businesses is that you have very little access to financing. Absolutely. Yeah. And the last one? Last one, last one which I wish I did from the start is um, macro marketing. Right. So, so, so I focus a lot of my energy on micro marketing. So yeah. it was... Um, um, consumer marketing so you know building the Instagram page building the Twitter page reading the Facebook page and it really helped we we have an Instagram shop and a Facebook page and we do get a lot of orders especially when we're doing uh, promoted ads and all of that promotions we do get a lot of buyers but um, they I think there's some skepticism about engaging with government organizations that are set up to to assist SMEs. Um, so currently, um, you mentioned Dubai Expo, so we're going to Dubai Expo. Dubai Expo is a really big deal. Every four years, there's a world expo that is held in a country, in different countries. So, um, so eight years ago, it was in Milan, um, and then it was, the next one was in China, and now it's going to be in Dubai. Uh, for six months, starting from October until um, next year, March. And this uh, is the 22. biggest uh, business expo yes. that anyone can get into. And yes. This is such a big deal for for any business uh, to get into and to market the product because it opens up, uh, hopefully, opens up your business to, yes. the, to the other world. And and so it's something I, I must say that as a Kenyan or, or African, this is something I'm really proud because then. Thank you. Uh, there are not many businesses that start from the beginning, I mean young businesses that end up going into the expo. Yeah. And so just, so it's happening in Dubai, you said? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's happening in Dubai and um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's the biggest world expo. It's a business expo. There's, you know, all sorts, tourism, um, horticulture, food. Um, and it's, it's, it's this, there's a pavilion for Kenyan, um, made in Kenya products. And um, 
Marigat Gold will be on the pavilion for six months. We've already shipped, sh shipped our products and um, we'll be selling. I'll be there physically to sell. Um, but even more important than even selling um, single uni units is the deal rooms. There'll be deal rooms where buyers from all over the world come and you can go and uh, pitch your business um, to yeah. them. Um, and that's, that's really the goal. It's um, to sign bigger deals uh, so that we can start exporting. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's quite, quite, quite interesting. Um, it's quite interesting, uh, and and so if really if there's anyone who's watching this, whatever part of the world you are in, be it Africa or rest of the world, um, be sure to visit the Kenyan Pavilion. Yes, um, Marigat Gold will be there. You know, this is a product. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know, Marigat Gold will be there, um, and it's something um, Kenya has very good on yeah, from different parts of the country. And it's um, I have a chat with Sylvia, and it's something that you, I'm sure you would um, be be uh, looking forward to 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 to, to do it. Yeah. Finally, mm -hmm. this is something that every human being who buys honey, who takes honey, who goes into the supermarket. There's just so much adulterated, uh, adulterated honey in town. Past. When you go to the supermarket, there's millions of honey brands. Mm, mm. Like, how do you tell between fake honey and good honey? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, 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 we need to know that because yeah. I mean, this, I, I, I even don't know. So. Yeah. So, so, so I'll just take you back one step. Um, so, so, so this is acacia honey, as you can see, acacia tree, and uh, it's a predo predominant tree in in Baringo. So, so this is the other thing. Not many people know that there's different types of honey, wow. and they're always like, um, they're like, oh, do you add acacia? juice into the honey no is it dark yeah is it light exactly yeah. so it it really depends on what the bee is feeding on what the bee is foraging on so for example this one um uh we we set up to 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 just to sort out some of the supply issues that we had um or, uh, Originally, when we started the business, we we're still buying from smallholder farmers, but then we set up our own hives. So this honey is coming from the acacia tree because our hives are, I would say, where the hives are located in, in Baringo, I would say 80% of the natural vegetation is acacia trees. That's why you'll find it will probably be, I would say, give or take 80% of this is um, from, from, from the acacia tree. Um, so the taste will usually vary, the color will vary based on very many things. So for example, um, where the, for this one it's in acacia and then you'll find um, more highland honey um, in places like Mao Forest. Um, will have another distinct flavor and distinct color. So that's what differentiate when sometimes you go and you'll see um, like this is a bit lighter in, in, in color. Sometimes you'll see darker honey. It really depends on what the bees are feeding on. And um, also the season. Um, at the beginning of the season, um, when there's an abundance of flowers, um, sometimes the, the color will be a bit lighter. Um, but then as the season uh, goes along, um, the, 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 the color and, and sometimes even the taste will, will change. Um, in terms of um, fake and real. fake and genuine honey, yes. Um, first, there's a, you see there's very many honey brands yeah. um, on the shelves. There's a shortage of there's a there's a deficit of honey in Kenya. Correct. Um, so the demand, I would say, we're not meeting the demand. Um, and and there's been a lot of deforestation in in Kenya specifically. Yes. compared to our neighbors like Uganda, South Sudan, um, Tanzania, where, where a lot of the honey comes from is because they have kept a lot of their natural vegetation. Yeah. Um, they, they, that's why we, we're really struggling to meet the demand for, for okay. natural Kenyan honey in, in Kenya. That's why, you know, producers like myself who are setting up hives are very important, of course, for pollination because bees are grateful um, our Absolutely. ecosystem and, and, and um, mm. 
very important to pollination, to the process of pollination. Now to get to the most interesting part, how do you tell um, fake and genuine honey? Um, so the Kenya Bureau of Standards have, they've actually put in place very stringent measures um, to get the CAB certification. And um, I would say the most foolproof way is of course to get it tested in a lab. Um, so cabs do uh, something called a Fisher's test, um, the test for a, vari a variety of things. Um, so the first one will be the moisture content in the honey. Um, so usually that, that doesn't mean, yes, so, it, so, so even, even when bees are producing honey, um, a comb, you, this is a bit of a long explanation, but basically, um, Bees have to completely seal the comb with beeswax, Correct. so that because they it's nobody cool. understands the process that it, they say it's one of the most complex um, chemical. I would say not chemical process. It's one of the most complex processes the the production of honey, and um, I would I would say. I would say only God can explain <laughs> because the process of making the bees making the honey is usually it's such Something a complex yeah. yeah it's it's I would say it's short of miraculous correct so the the the, the bees have the formula in their brains <laughs> correct and once they get the formula right and the honey has is mature to a certain extent they will fill in the cells in a in a in a honeycomb and then seal it with beeswax yes, correct and you cannot harvest that that honey if it's not completely sealed because that means there'll be a lot of the times maybe if it rains and and the and the and the, and the water gets into the honey mm. it will be adulterated correct. Uh, because um, even you know the process of making um, honey brew <laughs> yes uh, muratina yes is really adultering the honey um, to a certain extent and then it ferments yes. and that can happen usually when 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 honey is not um, has not been capped fully by by the bees mm. so once we get the honey you take it to a lab and um, as I mentioned before the fishers test will taste will will test for the moisture content in the in the honey it will test for the glucose content as well um, and a couple of other things. So I would say the most foolproof way is to take it to a lab. There's a, there's a couple of certified labs in, in Kenya. I know KEBS does, uh, does the testing and uh, the Beekeeping Institute, um, near Lenana School, does the testing as well. Number two, if you don't have access to all of that, um, usually when you take a spoonful of honey um, and then pour it into a glass of water the stream should be consistent all the way to the bottom all the way to the bottom and should settle at the bottom okay. so it shouldn't disintegrate it right. shouldn't break apart yes you know like when you take juice for example and you pour sort of you'll see it just dilutes immediately so right. for honey it should be a steady stream that settled settled as a lump at the bottom of the of the okay. of the uh, cup of water correct so that's number two the third one is um, really about the viscosity. If you take a newspaper, um, again take a drop of honey, put it between newspaper, and um, when you when you fold the newspaper, you sh there's no moisture that should seep from the newspaper. Wow. Yeah. So if you, if if you take an orange or something and you and you press a newspaper together together, then you'll see the water will come out, the moisture will come out. With honey, it shouldn't it shouldn't mm. seep. Yeah. It should. It should just. The, it should. It should remain consistent. So I would say those are the. Can't go and do Don't all do of those things. Usually you'll just turn it. You'll just turn it, and same thing. It should be a steady stream. It shouldn't disintegrate. Right. Um. On the jar. So, um. Yeah. I think those. Those are two. I mean, people can try this at home. Yeah. But, one thing also that you mentioned to me, which I almost forgot, is that, crystallized honey. The one that I stay in your shelf is not necessarily a bad honey. Yes. It's true, right? So there's a misconception and I think I think the misconception really comes from a fear of the unknown. Yeah. Because people don't know how to test genuine honey. So for them the first thing they'll see they'll be like, Oh, your honey has crystallized that's so it's bad therefore honey. it's bad honey. Okay. They, people will be like, Oh, people are adding, I don't know, banana peels 
people are adding molasses, molasses people yeah. are adding sugar. Um, <laughs> yeah. Usually, and, and I think that's why, um, you know, if you go on our Instagram page, we really take you through the process of beekeeping, harvesting, just so that you can understand. I think it's really important to find a brand where you know where the honey is coming from. Correct. Because you have a lot of brands on the market where you're not sure they don't have a farm. Not that um, it's fine, they might be working with smallholder farmers, but then I think I think it's really important to have the traceability aspect and I feel like, you know, thank God for technology now that, that you know, people have... Um, yeah ways of tracing where the honey is coming from down to the supplier um, yeah. and um, so 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 we even we even if you look at our jar you'll see we write pure honey will crystallize to liquefy place the jar in hot water until it's liquefied because crystallization usually means that um, the the pollen content is really high right and actually that's what you need yeah. to fight colds to fight bacterial infection you need you need majority of um, your honey to be to, to 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 have a lot of pollen in it because that's that's what protects you that's what helps you fight antifungal and antibacterial that's properties. that's that, the, yeah those are the antifungal and antibacterial properties mm. um, but then I think you need to know where it's coming from um, unfortunately you can't sell raw honey yeah. Um, commercially in Kenya Correct. because it's uh, it's a uh, kept standards Correct. because just to standardize it you have to you have to pasteurize it that's why a lot of the honey you you won't see a lot of honey that has um, crystallization. crystallization and pollen on the on the shelves but yeah. then crystallization is good as long as you know where your honey is coming from yeah that's right. where all the uh, mm -hmm. health benefits are so, it's quite, so I think it's very important and, and it's, I know we can talk until <laughs> tomorrow but I think the critical things is know where your honey is coming from that's mm -hmm. very very important mm -hmm. um, second point is just you can do those few tests that, that Sylvia has suggested uh, if you really want to um, sort of check if the honey is good or bad so out of this um, chat with Sylvia what I've really come to sort of know or say is one just the challenges of business i think cash flow is management is very important and cash cash is always uh, sometimes we chase profits a lot um, and forget about cash flow so how much cash is circulating within your business are you able to buy goods tomorrow and and sort of uh, expand your business so not necessarily focusing on your profit two as an entrepreneur or anyone who is doing any business Remember, there's always um, a chicken and egg scenario. You'll always face that. That's quite important. I have faced it as well. And finally, always um, what you're saying about market. Now, I mean, I'll remind you again. Um, Sylvia is going for the Expo 2020. Uh, if you're in Dubai or planning to visit Dubai, uh, wherever part of the world, please go to the Kenyan uh, Pavilion. Pavilion. Yeah. Yeah, right. Kenyan Pavilion. I don't know which number it is, mm -hmm. and definitely you will find uh, among Kenyan suppliers or products, because Kenya supplies a range of products. You will find Sylvia, who is doing Marigat Gold or Liquid Gold <laughs> in Kenya. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So this has been upside down, and it's just basically trying to demystify many things about life, talking about different journeys, and mostly also talking about challenges or failures that people encounter because we don't talk about that too much and sometimes we focus so much as i said on the rosy side so till next time you guys always subscribe comment whatever you want to do yeah, let's get in touch if you want me to talk to you about your journey please drop me a message and i'm always looking forward to looking up uh, for you till then take care cheers <laughs>